I'm Catherine Walworth, curator at the Columbia Museum of Art, and I'm standing in our newest exhibition, Design by Time. And I'm very excited to introduce you today to our speaker, Dr. Lori Zokowski, otherwise known as Dr. Z. She's with the Department of Earth, Ocean, and Environment at the University of South Carolina, where she specializes in carbon dating, among other things, including marine science and climate change. I mean, she literally works on glaciers in Antarctica. This is just phenomenal. But when I met her, it was standing in a friend's kitchen where we were talking about simple solutions. I was telling her that I wanted to ride my bike to work, which is just such an everyday solution. And then I realized that the person I was talking to happens to be the chairman of Mayor Steve Benjamin's Climate Protection Action Committee, which is helping to move the city of Columbia to a 100% renewable energy format by 2036. So who better to think about this idea of time and everyday solutions through design than Dr. Zokowski? So I'm very excited to bring her voice in today from a, a very different but equally elegant place of conceptual thinking around nature and design and function in the future. We'd like to thank our sponsors today. As always, we can't do what we do without their help. Friend sponsors Ag First Farm Credit Bank, Joseph Bruce, Anne-Marie Stieritz, and John Karen. And of course, our patron sponsors. I'm very excited to present to you Dr. Lori Zokowski. Thank you so much for having me, and it's a real honor to be here today to, to give a science talk that goes along with the Design by Time exhibit. So my talk today is called On the Anthropocene, and I'm Dr. Lori Zokolsky from the University of South Carolina. And so really what I'm going to be talking to you about today is basically about some snapshots in Earth, Earth's history that really talks about both the vulnerability and the impact of life on Earth. And hopefully you'll see throughout this talk how this ends up relating to my impressions, at least, of the exhibit. So what is the Anthropocene before we get too far? Because this is a term that you may not have really heard of. And essentially, it is a theoretical or proposed new geologic era that is being, uh, going to be demarcating, essentially, humans' impact on the geological record. So theoretically, a lot of people say we're still in the Holocene, which is the period since the last Ice Age up until now. But we maybe have done enough to change the planet that we have now moved into a new geologic time. And that's the Anthropocene. So if we look back further in geologic time, what do things look like? So the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. And when we look at its history through time, we often think about the fossil record as its demarcations, or basically recording the differences of what's happened over time. And for the first 2.5 billion years of Earth's life, or of life on Earth, there wasn't really that much life on Earth, and that's why you don't see many, many fossils in the Earth's record. Whereas if we move um, more modern, that's going up in the geologic record, you start seeing differences in those fossils. And that's essentially because over the 4.5 billion years of Earth's history, it's a story of the changes of life on Earth. And so today I'm going to talk about some of those changes and why those happened. And we can only really see those when we look over time. So this is really going to be a talk that's in three acts, and that's looking at life, how life impacts the planet, and that's going to be some of the oldest life and how that basically got the rise of oxygen and why we have oxygen today. Then it's also about how life is vulnerable, and you'll see on that geologic record of those fossils that there's mass extinction events, and those mass extinction events really illustrate how we are vulnerable here on Earth, or all life is vulnerable here on Earth. And then really the third act is about how humans are impacting the planet. So first, how life impacts the planet. So if we step back and take a picture of the Earth and look at the, the Earth from outer space, we see a blue planet, more than a soily planet, which is kind of ironic that we call it Earth. But we also see green of the land masses. And that green essentially means that life is there. But that's not how it's always been. So if we stop for a second and take a breath in and breathe and then breathe out, why are we breathing? We're breathing because we're getting the oxygen. And so oxygen is in the atmosphere today at about 21%. Hasn't always been that way, but that oxygen is actually the waste of trees. Because when trees grow and collect the carbon from the atmosphere, their byproduct is oxygen. So we have to remember that sometimes what's around the planet is actually the waste products of other things. 
So going back to that geologic record and just remembering the oldest parts of the record from 4.5 to 2.5 billion years, there's not that many fossils. And why not? Because there wasn't really that much life. So I'm going to be talking you through a few graphs in this talk, and I'm going to do this with the two different styles of graphs that I'm going to show you, where I'm going to start with the empty box and talk you through what you might be seeing before I actually show you data, so it's not overwhelming. And so basically what we're seeing, instead of time on the, on the vertical, now we're looking at time on the horizontal. And so on the left-hand side is today, and then on the right-hand side is the oldest uh, time, so 4.5 billion years when life formed. And then there's going to be two types of data shown, and they're going to be in green and blue. So the green on the left axis is going to be oxygen in the atmosphere. And so that unit, PAL, is the percent of current levels. So basically, if it's anything below that 10 to the 0, it's less than today. The blue on the other side of the axis is going to be oxygen in the ocean. You have to remember, there's oxygen in the water. That's what fish use. And so that's also going to be byproduct of photosynthesis in the ocean. And so that anything below the 10 to the 0 is less than today. So if I show you what the data looks like, for the first 2 billion years of Earth's, of Earth's existence, there wasn't oxygen around. And this is because there was primarily single cellular life that just didn't know, per se, how to do photosynthesis or have that sort of waste product. And there was these little whiffs of oxygen that happened during that time, but it didn't persist until about 2.5. And so that's what is called the great oxidation event. And that's really when things really took off in terms of life on the planet before that it hadn't. And so how did this happen? And essentially it was you went from single cellular life that became multicellular. And when it was multicellular, it could then attach to things. And so it could attach to things like these stromatolites. So these are from Western Australia. And these are actually where they think that some of the earliest life formed. And once you had that, it, it could attach to things that were close to the surface of the ocean, where it could have enough sunlight for photosynthesis. And then really, once it was doing that photosynthesis, you could have oxygen formation. But how do we know that really happened? And that's because we have records of time. And so these, this rock is 2.5 billion year old rock. And what you see of those layers is essentially sediments that have been accumulated over time. So you have the oldest sediments at the bottom and the youngest sediments at, top, at the top. And those really red bands there are called banded iron formations. And in the ocean, iron doesn't like to exist with oxygen. And when oxygen is there, it precipitates out, and so it goes into the rock. And so these really red bands are essentially showing us when the oxygen was in the ocean, and that it was whiffs of time. These banded iron formations are also where we do a lot of mining for steel, because we need the iron oxide to make steel. So when we look at the planet today, we have to remember it hasn't always been that way. And so that life can have the potential to impact the planet, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. So then we also need to think about how life is vulnerable. And with that, when we look at the geologic record, we're looking at this fossils over time. And so there's often this thing called the golden spike. And the golden spike is what is used to demarcate the different layers. And they demarcate different layers by changes in what fossils are there. And that is basically indicative of what life was there, because life has changed in terms of the species composition. One way we know this, essentially, is because these guys used to be on the planet. And they're not today. And so dinosaurs went extinct about 66 million years ago. If you've ever looked at any books about dinosaurs, they didn't exist in the same type of planet that we did. It was a very tropical and lush place. The climate was very different, which also tells you that the climate has changed over time. But they went extinct because of an external factor. And essentially that there was meteorites that came from outer space that were a little intense. Basically, they hit this certain part of, of Mexico that left this giant impact crater. And the material from that crater basically went up into the atmosphere and caused big changes to the climate, which then killed a lot of the animals on Earth. And so it was something that was external that caused the species extinction. It has also happened at other times in the past. And so 
I don't know if you've ever looked at Google Earth or anything like that, but in northern Quebec, there's a large crater feature that was also came at a time in the past, about 215 million years ago this time. And this giant impact crater may have been part of another species extinction that happened in the past. And so we just have to remember that there's outside factors that have in the past come and really changed things. Sometimes it's also been volcanoes that have changed the atmospheric composition, which killed things. But now we're in a different period. And so what you're looking at here is essentially North American megafauna. And so when there was the last ice age, around 25,000 years ago, these were the animals that existed in North America. These are not the animals that you see in North America today. And what happened essentially is that humans came to North America. And so around 14,000 years ago, as the glaciers were retreating, humans came to North America via Asia. And when they did, they were, um, came as hunters, but they also brought disease. And so between these two factors, all of these megafauna have essentially gone extinct. So this is some of the first evidence, basically, that humans have the ability to impact the planet. So to that end, how are humans impacting the planet today? So we might know this through looking at certain snapshots in time. And so this is 1871 in London. This is a Monet painting. And so basically, he's, some might see this as fog, but this is really during a time when there was lots of coal burning that was causing lots of detrimental health effects. And people were starting to realize perhaps it wasn't the best to be doing this. Today, we see things slightly differently. And so that some of the pollution that we have might be persistent in everywhere, and that it's things that we have made that are part of our everyday lives, but we don't know necessarily how to do better about it. So now is another set of graphs that I'm going to show you. Much shorter period of time. We're going to be looking at 1750 through to about a decade ago. And it's just because that's when this original data set was published. And I want you to think about all the things that have happened over this time period in terms of how society has changed in order to look at the data I'm about to show you. So we have the first factories starting to happen in the 1800s. And then once you had the people working in the factories, there was a bit of labor unrest as the work hours were a little too much and capitalism was starting to take over. And then so we started getting fossil fuels being part of the mix because they could replace humans. Then we had a few wars, maybe a little pandemic in between them. And then we had a big technological boom that happened. And basically there was better living through chemistry that started happening. And a lot of the synthetics that we have, the plastics, et cetera, anything to our pharmaceuticals, all those chemicals come from fossil fuels. And we harnessed a lot of that knowledge during that time after the 50s. But then it has also been with its problems. And so the set of graphs I'm going to show you are going to have a certain trend to them. And so I'm going to show you something like 12, 15 graphs, but they're all going to show you pretty much the same pattern. We have this slow increase from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to about 1950. And then from 1950 onwards, there's this great acceleration that happens. And so that's just really showing how humans have started taking off and impacting things. So first, if we look at population. And so population in 1750 was about a billion people. Today, it's 7.9 billion people. And most of that increase has happened since the 1950s. GDP has also increased. We've, not only are there more of us, but we're richer on average. And then there's more movement of foreign money through systems. There's also more people moving from rural areas to urban areas. So we're becoming basically a global nation of cities. And then we're also using a lot more energy. Most of this energy that we're using is also fossil fuel energy. And this will come back in a second. And then we also use a lot more fertilizer. Because there's more people, we need to grow more food. However, we need to basically supplement the land in order to be able to grow all that food. Growing all that food and making that fertilizer requires lots of energy. It also has detrimental environmental effects that we'll show later. It helps us grow food, but there's downfalls to it. 
We also have changed the Earth's surface in how we move water. We now have more large dams than ever. In fact, this week, if you've been seeing, poking around the news in China at all, they're also starting, they blew up a dam, I believe, last week because of lots of flooding. And the Three Gorges Dam is also slightly vulnerable because of all the flooding that's happening. And so that some of that is useful to us for power and for irrigation and water control, but also becomes problematic when there's large scale rain events. We use more water, partially because there's more of us, partially because we're having agriculture in areas where maybe we shouldn't. We make more paper. We drive around in cars more. We have more telecommunications, which is really helpful in the middle of a pandemic. And then we also have more international tourism. It'll be interesting to see how this changes, or maybe there'll be a little blip in these few years, but I have a feeling it will go back to how it was, because we are a curious set of people who want to go see things. But we can also see detrimental environmental effects. So we are capturing more marine fish. We are actually capturing them faster than they're naturally reproducing. So this is causing problems for how long there will be fish in the ocean. Some say there won't be any fish in the ocean by 2050. Some also say there'll be more weight of plastic in the ocean than biomass of fish in terms of weight by weight as we go further in time. We're doing far more aquaculture, which is basically farming of fish. And then this is where the fertilizers become a problem. And so we have a lot more nitrogen going into the coastal zone. And I don't know if you've ever taken a drive and you've seen ponds out in the country that have that nice green scum over them. And that type of thing is basically where there's lots of this one bloom that will suck up all the oxygen in the water and it would basically choke off the ability for more oxygen to get into the water. So this can actually starve water of oxygen. And certain areas, such as South Florida, they see a lot of this as a problem because it's starting to cause problems for the fish in the water in the coastal regions. So the more we add fertilizer, the more it runs off of our land, the more it gets into the ocean, and that can be problematic. There's also loss of tropical forests. And then we have domestication of land. There's less wild land. What I'm not showing you is also the difference between how much we have had of wildlife and domesticated uh, animals. And essentially that we have far, far, far more domesticated animals by mass than we do of wild animals left. And it's partially through our uh, love of agriculture in terms of meat. And then, so we also have that there's a lot of uh, degradation of the biosphere. And so the, embedded within this is that there's species depletion. And so this is where we're essentially starting to see that we, you know, in terms of our activities, are depleting the land because there's so many of us. And what I haven't really talked about, though, is how that's impacting the temperatures. This has just been on all the impacts of us being so plentiful and using all these resources. But if you have been paying attention at all to climate change, you've heard about carbon dioxide rising and how that's going up and up and up. I believe we're at about 410 parts per million now, so no longer on this graph, and we're well above that. And we're nowhere near stopping in terms of our release of carbon. Nitrous oxide is also increasing, and so is methane. This past week, it was also announced that we had the highest methane emissions yet because fracking of natural gas is how a lot of methane is released because natural gas is, a, is methane itself, but there's a lot of um, transient emissions that happen through that process. And so these three essentially make up greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. And that is part of the reason why, over time, we've been seeing the temperature of the planet go up. You can see that it's not exactly a smooth line of going up, and that's just because there's lots of factors that are going to be impacting how the temperature increases. But if you look at the overall trend, you see that we were a cooler planet just 150, 200 years ago, and now we are warmer. And with the infrastructure that we have built so far, if we don't retire it, we are well on our way to going past two degrees, which was the target of the Paris Agreement. And so just to get a sense of what that temperature difference looks like, I'm going to show you this animation that essentially starts, maybe, yes. So it starts in the 1880s and essentially starts in the 1880s and goes through to today. And what is the, this is showing you is the, the temperature anomalies around the planet. So where you have cold regions and warm regions. And what I hope you will take away from this is not everywhere around the world is the same temperature all the time. The blue, there's blue for cool, red for hot. And you can see as we approach today, 
there's a really stunning difference in terms of where things are warming. And so and most of that warming happened over the past decade or two. And so most of the warming today is happening in the northern hemisphere where there's more land and that heats up more quickly, but it also ha is happening over the Arctic. And you, if you've been hearing on the news, Siberia has been 100 degrees over the past month, which is not normal. And there's permafrost there, which means that that could thaw and release more carbon. But there's also a really large ice sheet in the, in the Arctic, in the Greenland ice sheet. And if that melts, that can contribute to sea level rise. And so this is really problematic. And and so this is something that we need to do better on. We also have seen de uh, decreases in terms of stratospheric ozone. And so that is percent loss that you're looking at in the lower left. And then there's also uh, acidification of the ocean. And essentially, the more CO2 we have in the atmosphere, the more gas gets dissolved into the ocean. And that causes the ocean to become more acidic. The more acidic the ocean is, the less beneficial that is for life. And that can start causing problems and also cause some differences in chemistry. And right now, the ocean takes up about half of what we emit. And that will decrease as it gets warmer because colder water absorbs more gas than warmer water. And so essentially, that a warmer ocean won't be taking up as much CO2. And so this is kind of worrisome. So essentially, we have this, this thinking about life on Earth in three acts. We have life impacts the planet, life itself is vulnerable, and then humans are impacting the planet. And so we really have to think about moving another category above the Holocene on this little image. And that's, you know, I think depicted by the truck and the people. But there is some um, increasing pressure for there to be a new geologic era uh, being incorporated into textbooks. There is some drama within the geology community about this, because some don't feel like we have fully reached a delineation where others do. Some say the nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s was a time that will be clearly recorded in the rock record. And that was the beginning of the Great Acceleration. So when we look at the Earth and we think about what is happening here, we have to remember that no matter what happens, the Earth itself will be fine. The Earth itself will record, keep on recording life. But what life exists on the planet may change. And that is something that we just have to be mindful for about when we're thinking about protecting the Earth. We're not protecting the Earth. We're protecting humans' ability to survive. And so we need to think about our ability to do that and what changes we need to make. And so to that end, there is change that needs to be made. But how does one observe change? And this is where I think some of the tie comes into the exhibit. Because it's only by looking at things over time that you can really see change. And so often we see things as just a snapshot in time where you don't know if that is the same way it was in the past or what it's going to be like in the future. And so that is part of why those pieces are dynamic, is because it makes you think about more than the instantaneous moment. So to have change or observe change, essentially it requires time, time to be noticed, and time to take place to make things happen. And so as you look at the exhibit, you can see both how time was recorded within pieces, but also how some of the pieces took time to make. We also know that change is needed if we're going to be able to make some change. And so as a parting thought, I have two pieces in particular I want you to think about in terms of a pessimistic view that might motivate us to do better and an optimistic view about how we can do better in terms of these pieces. So if we think about it, a world that has a higher sea level, what is going to happen to coastal communities? Are we going to bulldoze all those houses? Are we going to be basically uh, taking away the infrastructure that was there, when those cities go underwater, they will become museums and history markings of their own. But you can also have the crystallization of the salt in the salt water that is going to form on some of those, those items that are going to be left there. And so this piece makes you think about what is it going to be like when the sea level rises? Will the beach be the beach? Will the coast be that recreational place you go or a relic in history? That is my pessimistic take on thinking about change in the pieces. But what about a positive take in terms of optimism? And here's where I want you to think about what could be. 
When Catherine was talking about the pieces in her talk, she talked about how the myocelium can be used to make new uh, materials and how it can be anything from packing nuts to whatnot. However, this material of using fungus to grow some new material is actually being used by the fashion industry to perhaps have a new type of leather that doesn't require an animal hide. And so it's about thinking about how we can make new products that capitalize on nature. And it's only when thinking about how in the past we probably haven't done the best and thinking about the long term and how we can do it more sustainably in the future. And so that's just a take that I have on thinking about some of these pieces. And it's only without, only in, if you think about it in time, can you really be able to appreciate where we've been and where we're going and how we can do better. So to that end, I say thank you for your attention and let me know if you have any questions. So while I wait uh, to see if any of you have questions, just because there's a delay in how I'm seeing you versus what's online, there, uh, there was a question that came up that was in terms of, do you think in terms of today's technology, uh, we will be able to predict or prevent another mass extinction, like a meteorite that destroyed the dinosaurs? Uh, can we can prevent that from occurring? And so I think, hasn't there been movies made about this in terms of us being able to uh, shoot, meteor, uh, shoot the meteorites that are coming at us? And so I think that, I think it's possible that we have enough technology to be able to prepare ourselves and to be able to protect ourselves from a meteorite that's coming. However, I think it would also be in our best interest if we focused on trying to use some of that technological development on trying to do better things today and solving the problems that we have here. All right, so uh, there was a question oh, from Bob about how can scientists and artists collaborate to create a, a positive future? And so I think that Part of what happens sometimes with science is that we get quite isolated in terms of how we look at the science and how we try communicating it. We don't always have all of the best skills in terms of uh, being able to communicate it to a broader audience. So perhaps by being able to uh, do some work with artists and collaborating with trying to communicate the science with through some art pieces or something like that, that it would be able to uh, reach a broader audience and be able to get more people understanding the importance of what the science is. So uh, from, from Larry, there's a question about, am, am I personally optimistic or pessimistic? I think that really depends on the day. Uh, I think that I'm optimistic in some, in some ways about over the past four years, we've really made a lot of progress on it being a topic that a lot more people talk about. Uh, we need there to be more federal policies that really are helping us control some of what we're doing and we're not having that happen right now. And so that is one way in which you could be pessimistic. However, if you look at, say, the upcoming election, that there already has been talk about environmental issues in terms of something that's very important for it. And that has not been something that's been on center stage in the past. So that is really making me optimistic the more people are talking about it. All right, so there was another question about looking at today's global warming trends, how far into the future will the climate severely impact our day-to-day -day lives? So it's worth remembering that right now we are fueling everything on the planet through the burning of fossil fuels. Not everything, but I would say probably like 70% of our energy on Earth right now is coming through the burning of fossil fuels. So each year we emit about 40 billion tons of carbon. We are not slowing down and that means that the carbon is accumulating. The carbon actually stay, will stay in the atmosphere for probably a few thousand years. So what we do today will impact many future generations. And so it's really, really, really important that we start turning things around and that we also harness new technologies to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so there's something you may have heard of that's called carbon capture and storage. And so that's basically where you can capture the carbon that's either in the atmosphere or what's coming out of a coal-fired power plant. 
And if we can start doing that, that's one way in which we can start reducing the carbon in the atmosphere, and that will decrease how long things have been around, or how long the carbon will be impacting us. So Jacqueline asked, what small step or steps can we do to, to promote a better outcome for the future of the environment? Vote. <laughs> so really, the, because there's many that we've been, all been told that there's individual things that we can do. But there's only so much that you can do as an individual because so many things are built into the system and how we operate. And so you have no control about how you use power from a power plant and you have no control about how things are structured in terms of your transportation system in general. And so to that end, what you have the greatest control over is doing as a citizen is being able to vote with the environment in mind. And that is not something that's often on people's mind when they go to the, to the ballot box but it is really important because this is something that will end up impacting the global economy. We have seen a lot in terms of the impacts of the global economy due to the virus. However, there is expected to be slowdowns in terms of the global economy as we have to start adapting to climate change. Like think about how much Charleston is spending on having the water diversion program. And so that that type of thing is going to be happening more and more. And so it's gonna cost us a lot if we don't start taking action. So voting is really important. So uh, there was a question about how do you think our species, uh, how do you think our species eventually go extinct? And how long do you think we have left? Whew. I think so. Just to clarify, do you mean about us as in humans, or do you think the species all around us? And so humans are pretty persistent. I think that some humans will probably persist. You never know. With all these people launching um, missions to Mars, if, was it UAE, China, and now today the United States are launching missions to Mars? Some people think that we can go off the planet, but that's not going to help everybody. So we have to start thinking, how can we help the most people? And so how can we do better to help everybody? I'm not going to say that we're all going to go extinct because how can we have optimism if we're going to talk about it, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> it's hard, but it's in terms of we just have to figure out how we can do better. All right. So what else do we have here? Although humans, so there's a question that came earlier that was, although humans are currently increasing CO2 levels at an unnatural rate, do you think global warming could have occurred at the same scale as it is now without human interference? Essentially, when we solve prevent this issue now, what's preventing another phenomenon like this occurring around the corner? So in the past, there have been times where the plant has been super warm, but what has caused it has been usually something to do with volcanic eruptions, and it's taken millions of years for it to form and millions of years for it to go away. And so what's really unprecedented about what's happening now is how quickly this has happened. And it's because we have figured out how to harness fossil fuels. And so we have figured out how to take ancient carbon from the, the solid rock and essentially put it into the atmosphere. And so nothing in nature in the past has ever really emitted as much CO2 as quickly as we have. In the past, there's been times of cooling when there was the ice ages and that had to do with another external factor about how the sun's orbit was happening. But again, none of that has ever happened over the course of about 200, 250 years. And so that we are industrious in our ability to uh, change the climate, essentially. Okay. So, there, and then earlier there was another question about what is the number one recommendation that someone can do to uh, make a difference about increasing, increasing with climate change or making a difference with climate change? I still iterate voting. And then that is the number one difference that people can make. There is, and so there's also, if you, if you really feel compelled to do things to, to uh, as, as an individual to make things better, you can basically change how you use carbon. So that is flying less, that is driving less, that is thinking about what agricultural you, you use. So are you buying the vegetables that are 
off season from South America? Or are you buying your local things? Are you eating meat? Because how does everything get um, made in terms of every time you go up the food chain, you're losing energy. So a cow has to use a lot of energy in order to, in, to um, you're losing energy as you go up. And so eating, eating a meat-free diet can make a difference. All right, so there's a question from Maisie about how can the CO2 capturing machines you mentioned earlier safely store the, the gas from re-entering the environment? That's a great question. So some people have thought about how we might be able to uh, take CO2 and basically force it into the ground. Most techniques in the United States that are using this, well, there was really, there's only really one power plant that's doing this right now, it's Petronova, and I believe it's in Louisiana. And they were basically capturing CO2 from a coal power plant, and they were using it to force the CO2 into the ground and get more oil up. It's a concept called enhanced oil recovery. That is not really helping us in terms of storing the CO2. And so some people have thought if we can put it in deep aquifers, that's one way you could store it. There are also some groups who are working on trying to make it into composites, like a type of plastic or something like that, that will be stable over time. And so the hope is that perhaps if we can figure out how to store that carbon, convert it from a gas into a solid, that that solid will be stable over time, that hopefully that will be a way in which we can store it and make it so it doesn't return to the atmosphere. But this is the trick because we've been really great about emitting billions of tons of CO2 each year to the atmosphere. So how do we actually reverse that? And so that's the challenge. What else do you want to know about? <laughs> oh, so you can tell us, can you tell us a little bit about things that people have started to design to combat climate change and how design can play a crucial role in sustainability. And so they were bringing up the question in terms of thinking about um, with the great carbon, uh, garbage patch and so are there ways that we can remove things. And so one, we can think about ways in terms of just altering climate. So we've already talked about how to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so that is one way in which you can reduce the impact of CO2. And the other thing that is happening is that we are also able to change how the temperature is uh, being, how we feel the temperature on the planet. So pretty much all the heating on the planet happens through the, the incoming solar radiation, so what we get from the sun. And so is there a way in which we can basically uh, dim the sun slightly so that we see less of the sun and that heats the planet less. That's the concept called geoengineering. And so we see that naturally when a volcano erupts or like say when the meteorites hit and, it, and there was the dust in the atmosphere. And so when a volcano, certain volcanoes erupt and you get aerosols in the atmosphere, that essentially provides a sunshade. And so there are many scientists right now who are working on whether or not we can um, whether or, not we can, uh, whether or not we can shade the earth from the sun. And so this is, the geoengineering is basically putting fake volcanic eruptions into the atmosphere. There are currently no global rules about this, and it is currently pretty much the cheapest solution to climate change right now, $2 billion, which is what, one of those stimulus bills right now, that would be enough to cool the planet by a few degrees over a few years. There are downfalls, you won't see the stars, might cause some lots of rain, and over those few years, we might get some temporary cooling, but later, uh, that's gonna cause some problems because it's going to have, uh, will rebound unless we put more sulfate aerosols. So this geoengineering concept is something I encourage you to go look at because it's likely to be the thing that will be used over the next few decades to cool the planet while we have enough technology to get us fully off of the carbon. So on that slightly apocalyptic note, I will uh, say thank you very much uh, for coming and uh, Thank you very much for your questions and your curiosity about this. Feel free to contact me if you have more questions and uh, I hope you have a nice night.